especially on this wintry day that the, the days that just <laughs> continue to come and come, all these chilly days. But um, I just wanted to make a quick announcement um, in the back. As you probably already noticed, we've got some light snacks and coffee and tea, so please feel free to help yourself. There's also some brochures um, in the corner there. We have a copy of the list of all the rest of the lunchtime lectures that we have for the remainder of the semester. Those are um, available. And also a, um, a listserv sign-in sheet if you're not on our listserv and you'd like to stay abreast of all of our events. Um, there's also a handout there for um, a conference that's coming up that has to do with Brazil. And um, that's through our linkage with the Brazil Initiative Project. And so that is um, available. So thank you very much for coming. I'll turn it over to Alberto Marcos. Thank you, Tara. And, uh, Welcome everybody. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Daniel Frederick. Daniel got his PhD here in campus in curriculum and instruction, and also with a minor in Latin American studies. So it's great to have alums coming back and presenting us to see what they're what they're doing. Daniel is an assistant professor in the Department of Curriculum and Teaching in the Teachers College at Columbia University. I uh, learned that he just received an Early Career Scholar Award from the American Educational Research Association, uh, their special interest group on critical issues in curriculum and cultural studies. So congratulations on that award. Uh, Daniel's interest is in, in the systems of thought that travel in teacher education and the political of the knowledge of education. Uh, his talk today is um, titled Democratic Education as a Curricular Problem, Memory, History, and Teaching in Post-Dictatorship Argentina. Uh, Daniel also published a book. Um, the title of the book is Democratic Education as a Curricular Problem. Uh, it was published by Rutledge in 2013. Um, so with that, I just want to welcome Daniel and uh, we'll hear what he says. He's going to talk about 40 minutes and then we'll have uh, time for discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for the LASIS program and, and for and CNI for sponsoring my, my visit. It's, it's, I said this yesterday in the lecture I gave in CNI, but it's very special to come back, right? It's, I wrote basically what would become this book, which was at the time of my dissertation here, I finished in 2010. Um, one of the courses that mostly inspired my research was the one I took with Senia. Uh, Tom Popkowitz is my advisor. So it's, it's very special. It's very different to present here than anywhere else. So thanks for coming. So um, yesterday's <coughs> talk focused most on the, mostly on the curricular issues, because most people there were not necessarily interested in Latin America. So today's talk, I, I thought of doing uh, something that merged those curricular interests with some of the things that are going on in Argentina, as, as I see them, uh, in terms of how the dictatorship, the period of the dictatorship from the late 70s and early 80s is being taught and talked about right now. But um, I want to start with a little anecdote that shaped uh, part of how I was seeing the problem at stake. And it has to do with uh, when I went back to Argentina to do my field work in 2008, um, I, was, I was walking with my dad. And, and for the first time, I was almost 30 years old. And for the first time, I asked him, how come you, like most of the middle class in Buenos Aires, how come you lived through all that and you still claim you had no idea what was going on? What, what was going, like, how could it be that 30,000 people were disappeared, tortured, and killed the largest urban concentration camp in the country was 15 blocks from your house. And you still claim that you only found this out after the trials in 83. And his response, I mean, and I consider my dad a very, very smart guy, a uh, very progressive guy. And, and his response really shifted the way I was thinking of the dissertation. His response was, look, I was born in Bolivia. Uh, then I moved to Chile. Then I moved to Argentina. And until 1983, except for two years in Chile, I never lived in a democracy. So in Bolivia, my, my childhood was coup after coup after coup after coup. In Chile, I lived two years in democracy, then the, uh, Pinochet's coup. And then I moved to Argentina in 78 in the middle of the military dictatorship. So for me, seeing people in civilian clothes with guns, grabbing people and putting them in the cars and driving away, uh, looking over my shoulder, and all that, that, was, that was normal. That was how you, you, you live. 
It wasn't that I didn't know. What I didn't know was that was not what was supposed to happen, right? And that response really shifted the way I was thinking of the problem, which I'm going to talk in a second. Because that what made me think is, so what is it that we now consider normal? What is it how in the ways we live that we now consider something that is normal, that in 20 or 30 years, our kids are going to ask us, how come you didn't see this? How come this happened and you had no clue? So that's part of how I'm trying to frame this conversation. What are the things that are going on pedagogically, but not only uh, related to dictatorship, that now for us are how things are supposed to be, that now for us are the common sense, but that we should step back and try to think about more carefully. So more specifically, uh, the book tries to deal with the shifts that have taken and are taking place in the pedagogical production of citizens in Argentina in the last 20 years as related to Las dictatorship. And it has to do with the other step, the other part of uh, anecdotal part that, that has to do with when I went to school in Argentina during my high school, which happened all in the early 90s and up to the mid 90s, we never touched upon dictatorship. Dictatorship was really not part of the curriculum. And this is an experience shared with uh, most people I know in my age range. However, when I was a teacher there, in the early 2000s, the dictatorship had moved to the core of the curricula. In every subject area, in every grade, I was an elementary school teacher, we were supposed to talk about dictatorship. People were supposed to read particular books because they were banned in dictatorship. People were supposed to do certain things because they were. So in a way, there was a shift that moved the dictatorship to the center of the curriculum. And that's what triggered my interest. What's going on? How is it that dictatorship is being used to define what a citizen is always in opposition? So what are those shifts that took place? And again, what is the normal now? So then, I, uh, after that very general problem, and, and I'm sorry for people that were there yesterday. I have to, this is a general introduction that I did yesterday too. I started opening up to think through which governing mechanisms and strategies does the production of citizenship, uh, the citizen takes place? What role do historical narratives play in the pedagogical production of the citizen? What is the common sense or the foundations ordering the pedagogical thought and action related to this. And finally, this is kind of the invitation at the end of the book, what happens when the foundation gets suspended? What happens when we stop assuming what is common sense to be common sense? What are the possibilities that have been opened up? In terms of the general theoretical framework of the work, I'm going to go sort of quickly through this because I really want to go get to the specifics uh, of the, the Argentinian cases. I understand the citizen as a technology of government. The citizen is not something natural out there, but it's a way of governing people and in, in way of producing a particular subjectivity in ways of what is possible to think and act upon. So within the big framework of Foucauldian studies, it's understanding governing not as a unidirectional power that oppresses people, but as all efforts end up shaping, guiding, and directing the conducts of others and the self. <clears throat> So within that, the idea of governmentality is about the positive production of notions such as freedom, agency, creativity, responsibility, citizenship. How are those notions possible and intelligible? So again, it's not taking those for granted, but seeing how they are produced through different discursive practices. So within the framework, the citizen, as I said, as technology government, is the subject that uses freedom in reasonable ways that can work his or her own way through problems by trusting own reasoning, established knowledge, and the power of expertise. And that possess, and this is a key component of, of my research, that possess a historical consciousness that guides thought and action in terms of loyalty to a project or nation. That is, it's a subject that is able to uh, position him or herself within a historical narrative that sees that narrative as his own narrative and then acts according to lessons learned from that past. That's how the responsible citizen is defined within this framework. <clears throat> so this notion of historical consciousness, and that's what I focused on yesterday, plays a key role in dissertation. Because it's a notion that although it's more present uh, in Latin America and in Europe, you can still read through it uh, in the case of um, American curriculum as well. And it's basically what it is, is this idea that we learn history in order not to repeat it. That cliché statement. And that says that the role of history is to learn certain moral lessons that are inherently there, that if only people learn history, they'll automatically become better citizens. So some people that uh, I, I, I draw from these people, 
from the field of philosophy of history in the 60s, come up with this notion of historical consciousness and define it as an inherent part of modernity, as something that we all have just for being modern. There is this possibility of seeing oneself as actors within the field of, uh, within, within history, right? That see the past as our own past and the future as uh, guiding our actions. <clears throat> However, when it's translated into a pedagogical device, something else happens. It's taken not anymore as an actuality, as something that everyone has because of being modern, but it's something that is to be formed by good education. So suddenly, it's not about subjects positioning themselves in history, but some subjects being able to do that. So there's a distinction between those who can and those who can't, those who see history and the lessons in that history as part of the self, and those who don't learn the right lessons. So therefore, cannot become that um, responsible citizen. So it goes from being an actuality into a potentiality, something that can develop if one is subjected to the right kind of education. So this idea of historical conscience is what helps people link their own past, present, and future within a singular narrative that positions him or herself within that narrative and that can use the past, the guideline for certain action. So and this is a very important process within education. It's the idea that we learn from the past to become better people. But that's also the idea that I want to question, the idea that the problem of, the, of history, the problem of the mistakes that we're not trying to repeat are because of a lack of education, as if reason was the unique way of getting salvation from those mistakes, and as if those moral lessons were inherently there in history, so the learning of history makes us better people. So within that framework, as I said, the responsible citizen becomes a subject who is able to position him or herself as part of a consensualized narrative about the past as a condition for the present, and then act according to lessons learned from that narrative. But as, as the work of many people, but among others, some people tell us, the issue is that when we gover govern the citizen, there's always at the same time necessarily the production of each other. Those who do not learn the right lessons, those who do not, are not responsible, and those who uh, pose a threat to the democratic pro progress of the nation. So what I'm trying to do here is, is try to think about how in the name of democracy we're producing its other that it's its own threat, right? And that and in some of the mechanisms in which we try to defend this idea of democracy by teaching the right lessons, by, by wanting to arrive at a particular uh, points, we are setting up certain mechanisms that look in some way similar to the mechanisms through which regimes like a dictatorship try to protect its own sense of nature, nationhood, but this time in the name of democracy. So this is where the overlaps with yesterday's presentation for those of you who were there stop. And so I, I need to talk a little bit about the brief historical context of Argentina to talk about how this plays out in that particular context right now. And, and uh, for those of you who are Latin Americanists, this might sound a little bit uh, redundant, but I have to go into this. So the Latin American dictatorship, which take, took place between 76 and 83, is usually seen as, it's spoken as in Argentina, as an interruption of the democratic order. And this particular way of seeing the dictatorship as an interruption of a democratic order plays a key role in what I'm saying, because what it assumes is that the natural order is democratic, Argentines are democratic, and there are interruptions to this order in the sense of it's dictatorship. So, in the early in the nineties, when I went through school, this, this 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 problematic past was seen as a hindrance in order to look up for a future. So that's the period when uh, the president of that time pardoned all the military uh, and all the torturers, all the genocides, in order to move on, in order to to forget about the past and look forward. So, part of the reason why. Um, the, the, the dictatorship was not part of the curriculum, was a particular view of the future not needing to look back. But there's a shift <clears throat> that takes place in the, in the 2000s that, and, and it's hard to put to pinpoint specific dates because things are processes that are more complex than that, but as a symbol, there's a crisis of 2001 that calls for every one of the politicians to leave. There's a, there's a big banking and political crisis that leads to five presidents in a matter of three months. And a big political shift in terms of how do we deal with the remains of the past? What happens now that um, 
we realize that we cannot just look forward without looking back. <clears throat> and within that last decade, uh, especially since uh, both Nestor and Christina Kirchner uh, came in power, there's a politics and a pedagogy of memory that are particular in the construction of Argentina, of, our, of what it means to be Argentine. And, and one thing that is important is, again, like there were efforts before. Clearly, the mothers were actors uh, in the process that had a, a much longer duration. In the city of Buenos Aires, there were the establishment of memorial sites that, that came before. But this is just a general marker of a shift, especially also in terms of curriculum. So within that context, one of the, uh, what I do is, within three chapters, I analyze different genres of texts related to dictatorship to try to understand how the past is mobilized in order to construct a citizen. One of the genres is legislation and official curricular, curricular documents. A second genre, which I'm going to talk about now, is textbooks. And a third genre is memorial spaces. And I think uh, I'm going to just talk about textbooks and memorial spaces because the as you will see with moral spaces, the possibilities open up by looking at those spaces in different ways, push against the limits of how we consider pedagogy right now. By looking at the textbooks, uh, something that's interesting is that when one looks at the textbooks that were published before the 20th anniversary of the coup in 96, one's, first of all, not all texts included the dictatorship as, as, a, as, a, as a content to be taught. But also the other part, part is interesting that up to the, up to the mid 90s, you can still find in some texts uh, support for dictatorship. The, the explicit idea that dictatorship was a necessary process to battle the guerrilla, that to defend the national identity from the threat of the left, uh, and that it was a, a war, all that narrative that was very much uh, part of the discourse of the dictatorship itself is still present in some textbooks up to the mid 90s. And after the 90s, something happened. After the mid something happens where there's a streamlining of the narrative. Suddenly, defending the dictatorship becomes taboo. A lot of people think that like that still, but it's not something that can be said out publicly and, and definitely not something that can be included in the textbooks. There's a streamlining of the narrative and a particular way of understanding history that starts appearing throughout all the textbooks from the most varied kind of publishers. And the reason why all these narratives are being streamlined, and the reason given to why we should teach all the spirit also becomes streamlined, which is as a way of defending democratic historical consciousness. The idea of the value of democracy, everyone should learn how good democracy is, and in order to do that, we need to learn the horrors of dictatorship. But the paradox there is that in order to defend the values of democracy, there are clear limits in what can and cannot be said, what can and cannot be shown, in those textbooks, um, which I, I, I quote here from Rancière, are based in my notion of a hatred of democracy. What would happen if we actually let people think? What would happen if we actually don't tell them what they should learn, but we show them what they need to learn? Um, a very illustrative example of this is there is one of the textbooks that has a photo of Galtieri, who was one of the was the, the last one of the of the generals to govern the country in dictatorship right before the war with Britain in 82, where he's in the balcony, and there's a huge mass of, mass of people supporting the war. Right? And the epigraph of the photo says something like, uh, 1982, uh, the, the Falkland War is about to begin, and so is the end of the dictatorship. What is not there, and is not throughout the text, is what are those hundreds of uh, thousands of people doing in the plaza. right? So. How is it that the, so the civil, so civic support of the dictatorship is never there in the narratives? Because that what presents is a problem, this idea of we, as a people, are inherently democratic, but we were taken over by this group, by this mentality, that suddenly, after the war, we woke up from, and we, were man we managed to kick them out. <clears throat> so some, some examples here are this. Uh, to quotes that I have, so today Argentine society maintains a difficult relationship with its recent past. It needs to appropriate it in order not to repeat it, and it's necessary to tell the story so that it never happens again. So it's again this idea that by telling it, it will never happen because there's a particular story we need to tell. <clears throat> so again, like one of the things I'm trying to do here is, is point to how this construction of the responsible citizen 
sets up limits on the possibilities of thought and action that would actually like represent a different notion of democracy. So the reason and knowledge act as salvation narratives, we need to learn these lessons in order not to repeat it, in order to, to, to guarantee, as if that were possible, the right way of acting in the future. But at the same time, by saying that we need to learn in order not to repeat it, what we're reporting is that the mistakes were done due to a lack of education, that other that is being constructed in terms of dictatorship is an other that is uneducated, uh, that is unreasonable. When we know that many of the generals and those people were highly educated people in particular ways. The narratives that are being presented in the textbooks are a progressive narrative of the nation. There's a linear way in which the narrative of the past is being presented, in which there is social and political unrest in the early 70s, there's a uh, coup in 76, repression and violence that leads to the Falkland War, and society wakes up, and there's a democratic opening. So while this is the narrative that's presented throughout all the texts that I analyzed, the questions that, that, that come up when one thinks of history as a progress of a democratic society that has interruptions is what happens to those things that don't fit that narrative of progress? What happens to those things that do not fit this, this particular way of seeing progress as, again, in the name of democracy? What is presented here is the idea of Argentines as being essentially democratic people that get deceived and then wake up. And the democratic education is seen as a preservation of this inherent democratic essence. As it's not a creative act of trying to think of what democracy means in the moment, but it means trying to protect ourselves from the threats of democracy that a democracy is already living within us. So what this progressive narrative of the nation tries to do is present us with a binary between authoritarianism and democracy. That such a construction for a, for a basis for construction of a distinction between us and them. Us, the democratic people, the people that always struggled for freedom, also the victims, them, the fascists, the, the repressors. And what this makes very difficult is again, the dialogue of continuity. So how is it that people were supporting the war like that? How is it that when the dictatorship came into being um, after the coup, a large amount of population were supportive of them? There is an a, impossibility of talking about the conservative seats in the thoughts of a particular sector of, of, of the country. And this is a conversation that's starting to emerge now in, in other areas, but in curriculum for elementary, and middle school, and high school are still very much on the fringes. So when there's an impossibility of talking about the continuities between what happened before the dictatorship and after, um, the dictatorship appears in an ungrateful lover, something that happened out of nowhere to us and that suddenly we became free of, right? Um, because the dictatorship kind of interrupts that process, but that process is, again, the natural order. So here's an interesting quote that I, uh, that I find uh, that makes us, help us think about this. So it says, no sacrifice, sacrifice is too great for our democracy, least of all the temporary sacrifice of democracy itself, right? The idea that in order to protect the democratic essence, we need to block certain narratives and certain ways of thinking out history in order that, that would threaten that democracy that we're trying to protect. So the question is when the protection of democracy slowly starts to become what democracy is being protected against, the line between democracy and authoritarianism starts to become quite blurry. And to present a different kind of thinking or the possibility of a different kind of thinking of pedagogy and of these spaces, I want to share with you a few images from the, the Parque de la Memoria, the memory park in Buenos Aires. Because what I think this, this space does is invite a different kind of thought about pedagogy and about what it means to think about responsibility in, 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 in terms that um, question what pedagogy means. So I, I'm going to share just with you a few images of the park. This is uh, one of the sculptures in the park.
this is a, a different part of the park, which is the monument where the names have disappeared. That started a little bit before dictatorship and ends a little after. That marks the names, and also it has an, an indication of the women that were pregnant in the monument. But let me tell you a bit about this park. This park is, first of all, in some ways in the fringes of the city. It faces the river in a city that is told, it's said to be turning its back on the river. So it's an area where not many people live, where not many buses get to. But more important than that, it's a space that has no guides. It has no one uh, telling, when you go into the park, you just circulate through the park. And there's one, no one telling you what lessons you should learn from this. There's no one telling you what the pedagogy of the space is supposed to be. It's just for any visitor to figure out. And you may not figure out anything. And you may, as you saw, some of the pieces of art are more abstract than others. And some of them can be said to represent the dictatorship only because they are in the memory park. If they were somewhere else, they would maybe be seen as something else. And what's a few things that are interesting about this place is um, yesterday I compared it to the, the former concentration camp of ESMA, which, not, which is now a, a museum of memory where you visit with a guide. And although the space is empty, the guide tries to, uh, it's, it's all the time filling up those spaces with narratives and particular lessons to be learned. And how that museum is a place that uh, many schools currently visit, but this is a